Hello, hi everyone. Uh, just to check, can all of you um, hear me well? Maybe you can just type in the chat that uh, if you can hear me well, just... Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hello, hi, Mario. Hi, Mohan. Thank you, Robert. Okay, I probably will start in um, one minute's time. Let's just give uh, the rest uh, another minute to join. And I hope that you don't mind my messy background because my clone does practice a hybrid uh, workforce schedule and I'm actually working from home today. So usually I would take calls in like a nice corner beside my living area. But today it's a little busy there because uh, now it's like after work hours for Singapore and I had to take it in my bedroom. So don't mind the background and um, just focus on the content later. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, I think I will get going. And since this is recorded, I I believe that you know um the rest who are interested can actually refer to the recording. Um, I'm actually very excited to join this uh, unique platform for the talent intelligence or related professionals like um all of us. I'm sure this will be a highly informative session for anyone even if some of you are actually exploring this career switch to this arena, or even when you are, you know, you're trying to build a sales pitch to your senior leadership to actually start this new function in your company. So it's a wonderful occasion to also celebrate how far talent intelligence have progressed and also to discuss the future looking and inspiring topics that um, has got to do with like the talent landscape and also the workforce intelligence. So for myself, this is a huge opportunity to be here to share my learnings and also uh, this topic of my interest. And I hope to also learn uh, and discover interesting insights from this community as well. Um, again, thanks for all the hard work by Toby, Ellen, and everyone who makes this event possible. So before I start, I am going to do a very, very quick introduction of myself. I am eating and I'm actually leading the talent intelligence function globally in Micron technology. This is a very new function created uh, in Micron as well. Uh, it's, we are about uh, like one and a half years old young. And today I'm going to share how um, the talent intelligence and market insights actually plays an integral um, part in setting the DEI representation and hiring goals. So the pursuit of this um, inclusive, diverse and equitable culture has already become a necessity for every high achieving company and that includes Micron. I'm sure that uh, many of you have come across like research um, articles or analysis that talks about the many benefits that DEI actually brings to an organization. It could be like a monetary tangible benefits um, in terms of bad financial results or it could be you know, uh, intangible, like contributing to the strong company culture or like advancing uh, innovation through diversity of thoughts of a perspective. So I think the foundation of first step is actually to create, uh, as in the foundation of first step to create this diverse workforce is to um, first set a realistic um, but ambitious goals. Again, there is no one size fit all kind of approach when we're talking about setting DEI goals. Um, because this goal should be customized to your individual company, unique vision, mission, culture, and strategy. So when we first started this a few years ago, I think um, one of the most common questions being asked by the different stakeholder involved is that, you know, what do we mean by a realistic goal? And how do we know if the goals that um, we have set are actually ambitious? So setting this DEI goal is not just a uh, one person and one or one team effort, uh, by the way, in, in the case that you are wondering, because in my company, it does involve close collaboration within the whole of people team that includes like DEI, PA, um, people analytics, business partner, and also um, the collaboration with business stakeholder and also require buy-in from senior leadership. And it includes many different steps of setting the goals and each time it does come with like a uh, uh, best practice of each of the steps and for today's purpose i think what i'm going to focus on is how um, talent market intelligence uh, can play an important role and how my team is employing some of these insights on setting a realistic but ambitious goal so um thanks for joining just um having a pause here to see if there's any questions um yeah great to see you Alison. 
Okay, so I'm going to go on next to um, answer the question of, you know, whether uh, it's realistic, whether, you know, um, the goals that we are setting is realistic or not. So the first step is to understand how uh, diversity representation looks like in the market. So then we begin to explore the talent addressable market that is actually applicable to the company. So um, if you are wondering, talent addressable market here refers to the market of um, the available talents for the roles that our companies are hiring. So if the company workforce in a particular country that it is operating in actually already mirrors the country workforce population, it's probably fine um, to use the country diversity representation as it is. But many a times, it's not so straightforward. For example, um, for tech companies or for semiconductor companies um, like Micron is in, we do see a significant percentage of employees that actually require STEM background or a STEM knowledge. And this is why, um, you know, sometimes um, for this group of talents, we are seeing a much smaller underrepresented group participation. So this is why we can't really just um, rely on that overall workforce diversity level that is typically reported um, on a national level or at a state level as it is, because it will not give us an accurate picture. So in fact, for industry like the tech uh, industry or semicon industry, using overall workforce diversity can actually result in an overestimation. Um, this is because usually the overall workforce diversity that a com country actually report does include other sectors and occupations that we are seeing a higher underrepresented group participation rate. Example would be like uh, the healthcare industry, um, education, hospitality, that is actually seeing a higher proportion of women. So at the end of the day, I think what we wanted to do is to benchmark the company workforce diversity uh, representation against what is actually existing in the market that is actually applicable to the company and not looking at the entire workforce population itself. So uh, let me give you an example. If you are looking at the slide here, um, sorry, I think it's not moving. Yeah, so if you are looking at the slide here, uh, if you are just uh, focusing in the US, you can see that the overall work, women workforce representation is actually at around 46%. Um, but if we zoom into the STEM workforce, it will give us a much smaller percentage of 28% uh, women a representation is like about 1.5 times uh, lower. So if we are going to compare our workforce representation to this overall talent dress for market, it then uh, gives us an unrealistic picture because we couldn't uh, just hire anyone that's available in the market itself. On the other hand, we can't only be basing on the STEM workforce diversity, which is at uh, the 28% itself, because uh, the company also hires workers without the STEM background. And, you know, if you're comparing company representation to only the STEM addressable market, it probably will return a great result because yeah, it, it will show that, you know, the company is actually doing really well in that area. The same is, uh, is the same when we look at the US ethnicity representation as well. When we see that the overall workforce for African American, the Hispanic, the Latinx to be uh, about 3% higher than that of the STEM workforce. So with this in mind, then we... But the next step that we are doing is that we try to review the company workforce profile and understanding, you know, categorizing the employees into roles that actually requiring STEM background uh, and knowledge and the roles that does not require that. And then we apply this ratio to the diversity representation that we have collected um, for the overall uh, workforce population and also the STEM workforce population in different countries that uh, uh, the company is operating in. So this helped to, um, as far as possible, mirrors uh, apple to apple comparison kind of thing. So you can see an um, example here. So um, please note that uh, this example here does not represent Micron in any way. I, I tried to say that it's, you know, company A workforce profile due to com confidentiality. So um, the number here is uh, something that I made up and does not repre represent my, com uh, my company. So in case you're wondering. So just to show that, you know, um, what we are doing in terms of first um, categorizing some of our workforce into um, the, uh, you know, technical or non-technical uh, portion. Uh, technical would mean that it requires them uh, experience, background or knowledge, and non-technical would be someone that does not require that. 
So by now, I think um, you may have noticed that it's actually a very simple methodology being employed here. Um, again, I, I'm trying to illustrate it uh, in details uh, using a simple graphic in this next slide. So we see that uh, in a case of, of teller addressable market in a specific country that's applicable to the company, we look at first what is the women representation in the overall workforce, which is um, 46%, and also what is the uh, women representation in the STEM workforce, in this case it's 28%. Then we apply the ratio of um, the technical uh, versus non-technical uh, categorization of workers uh, for the company. So in this case, we call it the company A. So it will be 20% for overall um, and 80% for just the STEM, uh, requiring the STEM background. So taking this weighted sum uh, provides us a good approximation of the teller addressable market as applicable to the country. So with this, we can get an approximation of like a teller addressable market that's applicable to this company for like, for example, women in a particular country. And we can um, just repeat this approach for the different countries that the company is operating in and also for the different diversity groups that the company are interested in. It could be like women, you know, underrepresented ethnicity, person with disability, um, veteran nationality, for example, like whether it's foreign percentage of foreigners versus uh, locals, um, you know, according to the company uh, area of focus. So after obtaining this uh, underrepresented data of teleaddressable market that's applicable to the company, then we can compare it to the you know, workforce representation and also the hiring to see how far we are from this teleaddressable market. So in this case, um, you know, you it, it depends on what is the focus area for your company. So in, in that sense that, you know, if uh, for a certain um, period of time, if you are looking into focusing at, um, for example, like uh, R&D talent. So you may want to have a specific focus into R&D talent um, instead of just looking at the overall workforce representation. So um, the same goes for hiring. So in this case, um, for my company, we strongly believe in the organically grown talents where we hire the new college graduates and then we groom them with the right industry and technical knowledge. So this is why we have a specific focus in looking at uh, diversity representation for graduates as well. So that's a separate uh, way of collecting, you know, um, the, the information or data point for new college graduates. So instead of looking at the national wide workforce uh, statistics, we now look at the uh, graduates diversity statistic itself. So this above methodology is actually um, uh, a very simple uh, methodology in the sense that we can be sure that we have a process that we can operationalize on a year-on-year -year basis. It is also um, important to ensure that on a year yearly basis, right, this data that we are collecting are uh, coming from official sources and then uh, it is also updating on an annual basis. So I think by now you might be wondering why, uh, you know, we stop at just technical versus uh, non-technical but not going down another level or even deeper to looking at, you know, individual job level. I think um, to answer this question, it is actually, we, we had that um, internal uh, discussion and uh, there's a debate going on as well, because I think um, it's a fine balance between, you know, comparing too broadly to the market or to like, for example, uh, as the example that I gave earlier to the national level, that, you know, it become uh, unrealistic in the sense that when you are comparing your company uh, performance to the teller addressable market or and it also can be you know um, it's a risk to go too specific down to even the job level because um, it might not be wise to define too narrowly by job when we are setting at uh, you know the company level uh, diversity goes because the intention of uh, embracing DEI is to allow for that diversity of background and also the diversity of thoughts so it does provide uh, more flexibility and um, creativity for us to consider um, the different adjacent skill sets. So one example would be like, um, you know, we um, also approach, um, try, try that approach of hiring and training a science graduate up to assume an engineering role. So if we consider just engineers or even going down deeper to a specific uh, engineering uh, discipline for that benchmarking, it is very likely that we might miss out this uh, potential talents that uh, we can tap on. 
Um, but having said that, once these diversity goals are set at a company level, and when we are trying to hire for that specific talents, we are typically doing a talent mapping analysis for individual roles to understand what is like the diversity representation for that particular roles or groups of roles. So this is the time that we then discuss with hiring managers on um, looking at possible adjacent skill sets. You know, if uh, the diversity representation is actually very low for the one that they are looking at, or even uh, looking at exploring other location, for example, uh, to, to actually expand uh, that talent reservoir market. So this topic does has uh, many different layers and I don't have all the answers to it, uh, to be very frank. So one thing that uh, I think we are all certain of is that using meaningful data to actually make this a decision, um, trying to avoid of any biasness is probably a good place to start. So I would also love to hear um, from some of you here on how you are actually benchmarking for your company as well. And we can pos uh, possibly learn from one another. Uh, you can feel free to just um, drop a note in a chat or you know, um, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn or just uh, email me uh, and we can have a further chat on this. Okay, I think uh, before I close this, I also wanted to talk a little bit about like on top of, you know, benchmarking uh, talent addressable market, uh, benchmarking our performance to a talent addressable market. Another way that, you know, we can ensure that, you know, where are we standing and, you know, which uh, uh, diversity goals that we should be setting like a best in class. Uh, one good way is actually compare the company performance to also other companies in the same industry to see um, where your company is actually standing. So I think at, at this era, we can easily research for companies' uh, DI performance from the net because many companies actually um, have started publishing uh, DI reports on publicly on an annual basis. But uh, I think just keep in mind also that there might be certain definition that uh, could be different and it's not aligned across the different companies. So just take into consideration before making any comparison of that sort. So um, before I close this, I also like to share quickly on a few guiding questions. Um, you know, how we set the diversity goals after you know where you're performing in terms of the talent addressable market. So we are using, using this few um, guiding questions of uh, the one how and two what. So how far is your company current workforce representation trend away from that uh, talent addressable market? So I think first understanding where we are standing in terms of talent addressable market. And uh, what is the volume of the new headcount growth in possibly the near term and also the long term? And what is like the predicted attrition for the overall workforce? How does it differ between uh, not just the entire um, predicted attrition and how, but also how did it differ uh, between the underrepresented groups and also the non underrepresented group of focus in your company? So taking into consideration of these uh, questions actually helps to understand how we should approach the goal setting. So for example, if the company is very far from talent addressable market diversity representation, and um, we know that it's actually ramping in the next uh, five years itself, it's probably a good opportunity to focus on setting an ambitious hiring goal to first meet this talent addressable market in that five years time of ramping. And that annual goal uh, of working towards this ultimate, uh, you know, we probably need to break down an annual goal working towards meeting this ultimate uh, uh, goal in the five years time and also break it down further on how the goal should look like for different um, organization, different countries itself, so that you know the right resources can be placed in uh, the right team, like for example, the recruiting team, and also highlight how is it a key priorities to the company because you know um, in that sense that uh, the there are diverse talents in the market that uh, the company is actually not effectively tapping on in a sense. So hiring in this case would then be a key factor to turn the needle. Of course, um, attrition is important, but in the sense, in this case itself, uh, it, hiring probably would be um, one key factors that you know move the uh, overall company representation uh, further. So again, there's uh, also lots of work to ensure like proper communication of intention of why uh, an ambitious goal and also ensuring inclusion after onboarding of the di diverse talents, which I will not go into details here because of the purpose of today's topic. So with this, I probably will close this and um, I'm going to open up to uh, any questions. If you have any. <clears throat> So, um, Alison, I think um, you have a question on 
a client looking for a job family level rather than a role. So um, yeah, okay, sounds like um, we are taking a wider approach. Have you seen line manager buying into this broader talent and reservable market? So um, Alison, I think um, when we are talking about this broader uh, talent addressable market, um, we are setting the goal in a sense of um, the, the company level goal or the organization uh, level goal itself. So in that sense, um, we, we have this uh, wider approach to first understanding you know, how we should approach it um, in, the, in the company level in that sense. And then in, in specific uh, roles itself or specific function or focus itself, then we do a, a separate talent mapping into that job family or you know the job role to really understand how does it look like for that uh, you know how does the talent addressable uh, market diversity level look like for that particular role and then we work towards um, bringing that specific role uh, up to uh, that talent addressable market so i think um, what what i'm sharing here is actually um, to talk more about at, at a company level and then we do have a separate approach uh, once uh, this company level go is set um, and go into deep uh, focus area to uh, certain roles that we are uh, would we want we would like to prioritize or we like to focus i'm not sure whether i'm answering your question and yeah let me know so um i think robert also asked a question on how do we get buy-in from managers or exec uh, in the different regions that have culturally different norms? So um, I think this is probably um, a change management that uh, is required. So at the start itself, I think what we did is that um, we do involve uh, managers and also like even um, you know people from the different uh, regions itself uh, into that groups or uh, the, the initial core group of you know looking at uh, setting this goal. So we, we do have a representative from each uh, countries that we are operating in um, for this discussion and goal setting. So, um, and also that's another important uh, way to look at it is also um, having representative from different organization itself because um, uh, different organization may have a slightly different um, uh, role requirement or skill set requirement. Uh, so they may uh, think that, you know, that at the company level or uh, kind of role itself, it, it might not uh, necessarily trend to whichever that they're seeing for the specific uh, uh, roles that they are hiring or the specific uh, employees that they, they have. So I think um, having this uh, uh, at the start itself, having uh, these people on board, uh, bringing them into that discussion, uh, listening to their thoughts uh, is, is really important. What results are you seeing in terms of the diversity of your hiring and is it working? So um, again, when we are setting a diversity goals, uh, after understanding how far we are actually from the talent addressable market, so we know that which are the areas that uh, we need to focus. It could be like uh, women in a, a specific country. It could be like uh, the underrepresented group in a specific country, uh, things like that. So um, that's a, probably a core area of focus that we are looking towards. And there might be also areas that, you know, we are probably already doing pretty well, uh, meaning that, you know, we are performing at or above the talent principle market that's applicable to the company. So in that sense, um, it allows us to uh, focus our resources and effort in the areas that we are seeing a further gap. So, uh, and then we do set a long-term goal and then also a yearly goal in order to meet this long-term goal. So it also, um, I think one way, uh, sometimes uh, in terms of hiring and staff, we may hire, hire in advance. Uh, in certain countries, we might hire like one or two years in advance. So having this one long-term goal does help us to align, you know, in a sense of um, even if you're hiring two years ahead, three years ahead kind of thing, you are, we are all aligned to that ultimate goals that we want to hit at the end of uh, maybe five or 10 years. So um, have you noticed more success at entry level or mid level? I can't answer this question probably for um, you know, the different companies, but I feel that in, in the sense of um, you know, entry level, uh, in, in the case of what we are looking at for um, the college graduates, usually it's, um, you, you will see um, a faster, I would say a quicker wins in that area because 
usually for the uh, employment labor market to change, it started with, you know, new college graduates entering that market. Of course, there are, will be like, um, you know, mid-career switch and things like that. But I think um, the one of the key um, talent pipelines is, is actually coming from these graduates, uh, graduate pool. So in that sense, you know, if we, uh, as, you know, different countries and, and stuff is actually um, putting more attention to DEI, um, incre increasing uh, the, the women representation or even underrepresented ethnicity representation uh, for, for this um, in the economy or in the, uh, the labor market itself, I think the first one that they will probably target is the graduates. So um, I feel that, you know, in, in that sense, you know, targeting the graduates might be, um, allowing us to see uh, quicker wins or um, higher successes in a, in a sense. But I'm open to <laughs> other uh, opinions that uh, any one of you here have. Oh, sorry. Um, does your diversity goals involve military folks or minorities who are disadvantaged? So um, yes, we do um, look into like um, the veterans um, or like um, the person with disability um, in, in terms of setting out diversity goals as well. I know some companies also look into like um, LGBTQ or, or even looking at for, for companies that are, you know, predominantly have hiring locals. Some of them are also looking at hiring um, you know, people of a foreign, uh, with a different nationality, like a foreigner versus a local kind of uh, observation. Um, who are your internal sponsors uh, of this project? Okay, we do when we are setting this team up in terms of um, setting a diversity goals uh, itself, we do have um, our people, um, the people leaders, uh, definitely our VP, C uh, CPO, Chief People Officer. And then um, we do uh, receive uh, quite a bit of support from our CEO as well, um, and also the rest of the business leaders. So I think uh, one key areas of focus is that um, the company has to see this as a uh, area of priorities. So then, um, you know, it does trickle down to that sense that, you know, in even at a uh, area level manager and all, you know, this is uh, something that they would like to see. So we call out that importance of the quality, diverse talents that is uh, uh, important to, to Micron for this uh, uh, period. How often are you evaluating and updating the benchmarking data? So I think when we are setting this, um, when we are operationalizing this uh, data, uh, you know, it, I would say that operationalizing how we are actually um, getting the data for our talent addressable market, we take into consideration of, you know, um, this different source of the data that's coming from whether are we actually um, able to update it on an annual basis. So we do evaluate um, the performance in terms of based on the goal on a monthly and quarterly basis, but how often do we uh, you know, mirror this performance back to the uh, teller addressable market, which is the, the data that we are benchmarking, that will be done on an annual basis. Um, what data sources do we do I use to get talent addressable market as far as possible? Um, because there are different uh, countries that we are operating in, we are getting the um, data from uh, the, the sources like um, in the US, we are getting from BLS, uh, for example. But if we are talking about that role specific data, uh, it will be coming from uh, some of the platform that we subscribe to. 
the telemapping platform that we are subscribing to. So on a national level, we are using it um, from the whichever database that uh, the country is actually reporting. Okay, um, sorry, I think we are probably time up. If I did not manage to answer your questions, uh, can you just drop me a note um, on LinkedIn, for example, and I can we can connect from there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.